Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our Lunch with a Friend series of live video presentations. I am very excited about today's presentation and so excited that, that you are here to be part of it. I'm Chris Knopp, the Executive Director of Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness. For over 40 years, Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness has been leading the fight to protect the Boundary Waters. Um, in these uh, new and difficult times, I want to wish all of you uh, the best from all of us here at, at Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness. We're all in this together and, uh, and we will get through this together. Today, the work of Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness focuses on three areas, wilderness, people, and community. For the wilderness, through lawsuits, legislation, and community action, we are protecting the wilderness from the threat of copper sulfide mining. There are two mines that present one threat to the Boundary Waters. Those two mines are Twin Metals and Polymet, and the topic of today's presentation is Twin Metals. For people, there are no boundaries to the Boundary Waters program. We are connecting uh, students all across Minnesota to the Boundary Waters through classroom education, online programs, and wilderness canoe trips. And for community, we recognize that Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness, that the wilderness and the communities that are gateways to the wilderness, Ely, Grand Marais, the North Shore, all have a shared fate, and that we must have those communities thrive in order to protect the wilderness. Today, our presentation is a plan for catastrophe, a detailed look at the Twin Metals Mine Plan. <laughs> Twin Metals has proposed a copper sulfide mine at the edge of the Boundary Waters at the confluence of the Kuishri River and Birch Lake. Copper sulfide mining has never been done in Minnesota. It is much different than iron mining. Copper sulfide mining is the most polluting industry in the United States. Twin Metals is owned by Anifagasta, a Chilean mining conglomerate that has a dismal environmental record around the world. In 2017, the Trump administration illegally reinstated Twin Metals expired mineral leases. We are now in federal court with our partners challenging this illegal action by the Trump administration. In the very near future, in the matter of days, we will file another lawsuit in federal court related to challenging uh, the mineral leases. On December 18th, 2019, a date that will truly live in infamy, Twin Metals submitted its mine plan of operation. In response, Friends of the Boundary Wilderness has assembled a team of experts to examine this, um, to examine the Twin Metals Mine Plan. Dr. Stephen Emmerman is part of our team of experts. My co-host this afternoon is Scott Beauchamp. Scott is the Policy Director for Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness. Uh, as a housekeeping matter, you cannot talk during this presentation, but you can communicate. And if you move your cursor to the bottom of the screen, you'll see a Q&A icon. You can ask questions uh, throughout this presentation, and uh, Scott and I will, will uh, I'll respond to those during the presentation, and then we can ask uh, Dr. Emmerman those questions that remain unanswered. You can also provide comments through the, through the chat icon as well. I know there are, are some uh, 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 pro copper sulfide mining people who are, are uh, uh, watching this presentation. And I wanna thank you so much for being part of it, that it is very important for us to uh, keep lines of communication open and to have these uh, conversations because we are, are truly all in this together. This presentation will last about 30 minutes and then we'll have a, a, a question and answer session with Dr. Emmerman following that. So without further ado, uh, I present <laughs> Dr. Steve Emmerman. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I am uh, Stephen Emmerman. I'm the owner of Moloch Consulting. That's a consulting company that specializes in groundwater and mining and uh, do projects in North America, South America, Europe, Africa, Asia. So I'm going to be speaking about a plan for catastrophe. And uh, I chose the title very carefully, a catastrophe a uh, technical term meaning a uh, total structural failure, a plan, a design. That is, we have a plan whose logical outcome will be total structural failure. And that's what I'm going to discuss. Okay, so first some location, uh, the Twin Metal site in um, northeastern Minnesota, right on the edge of the Boundary Waters Wilderness. Um, if you look at the small scale map on the right, um, you can see the edge of the project area, oh, just about three miles uh, on the edge of the Boundary Waters Wilderness and, and upstream from that wilderness. 
Okay, so let's look at some um, documents put out by Twin Metals Minnesota. Uh, two very interesting claims made regarding uh, the mining project. Uh, first, uh, look on the top. Uh, tailings stored in dry stacks are piles of sand topped by native soil and vegetation. There is no need for a dam to hold them in place, no possibility of dam failure, and no long-term storage issues. Okay, sounds good. We don't need to worry about the dam, fail dam failing, um, as for example happened in Brazil a year ago. If we look at the bottom, uh, water reuse practices, preliminary modeling indicates a wastewater treatment plant would not be needed on site. Okay, so the plan is that um, they will not be releasing any water into the environment, uh, total recycling of all water, so no need for any water treatment before water is released into the environment. Okay, and, and maybe at first uh, those sound positive, uh, but for a mining expert, um, the first time I read this, I started choking. Okay, because to say that there's no dam, so we don't have to worry about the dam failing, sounds a lot like we're not going to put brakes on our trucks, so no need to worry about the brakes failing. And um, we're going to recycle all water, so we don't, won't need a water treatment plant. Sounds like our building is going to be so fireproof, uh, we're not even going to install fire extinguishers. And um, both of those made me start choking. Okay, so anyway, uh, this is, uh, those two issues are what I want to consider. Um, that is this issue of no dam and this issue of no water treatment plant. Okay, so let's start with this whole question of, of filter tailings and, and what is that all about, okay? So first of all, tailings refers to the residue, the waste that's left over after you take the copper out of the ore. Okay, so a typical copper ore body might be 1% copper, uh, meaning it's 99% is, is waste rock, okay? Uh, so this waste rock, this is known as tailings, okay? And this is the conventional tailings management. Um, as the um, tailings come from the ore processing plant, they have a great deal of water mixed with them. Uh, tailings could be 150 to 400% water. And all of that is hydraulically injected through these pipes in the upstream direction. Okay, so this pipe is coming from the ore processing plant uh, up here somewhere, and the tailings and water come through and they're injected upstream. Uh, this is the Highland Valley copper mine in British Columbia. Uh, so tailings injected in this direction. Uh, the coarser tailings, more sand size, will settle here to form a beach. Uh, a little farther away will be the water and the finer tailings called slimes, and they will form the settling, settling pond and you can see a copper precipitating in that uh, settling pond. <laughs> okay, so what's the problem here? Is these conventional tailings facilities are very susceptible to failure by liquefaction. Okay, so what does that mean? If we start with a diagram on the left, we see that the solids are very loosely packed, but they still touch each other. There's water between the particles, but the particles touch each other, so the solids support the load. The reason they're so loosely packed is the tailings have not been compacted in any way. They've just been hydraulically injected um, into the tailings pond. So what happens if there's a disturbance? And that could be a small earthquake, it could be blasting. Um, in the case of the accident in Brazil last year, it was just heavy rainfall. Um, so when there's a disturbance, you can have a sudden compaction. If you look on the right-hand side, the sudden compaction of these um, solid particles, but it all happens so fast that the water does not have time to escape from between the particles. So the water simply becomes pressurized and it holds the particles apart, okay? So now, um, even though the particles are closer to each other, they don't touch each other. So the water is holding up the entire load, meaning the whole mixture simply behaves like a mass of water. So this liquefaction, this is promoted by loose packing, that is a lack of compaction, and the fact that the pores, that is the spaces between the solid particles, um, are saturated with water. I'll take a sip of water while this picture sinks in. 
Um, excessive water also increases the consequences of failure. Uh, January 25th, 2019, uh, dam in Brumadinho, Brazil uh, broke. Uh, the tailings traveled 75 miles per hour, buried 270 people, uh, the majority of whom were mine workers. Um, I think uh, some of you might be familiar with the plan for the Polymet mine. Um, the tailings dam with the Polymet mine would have the same design um, as uh, the design for the Brumadinho dam. Um, it's called upstream construction, and actually that kind of construction is now illegal in uh, Brazil, Chile, Peru, Ecuador, and, and now in the province of Ontario. Okay, so, so what is the state of the art here? Okay, the state of the art is not to store this mass of wet tailings, not to store a slurry, but to first filter the tailings in order to remove most of the water. Okay, so filter tailings have less than 25% water content and they behave much more like a moist soil. Now, the other advantage of filtering the tailings is that they can be compacted um, in the tailing storage facility. So you don't have excess water, you can pack the tailings so they can't undergo this sudden compaction that could lead to liquefaction. Okay, now I do wanna emphasize a couple of things, okay? And um, this will refer to the language um, in the Twin Metals Plan, okay? Twin Metals Plan talks about dry tailings, they talk about a dry stack facility. Filter tailings are not literally dry a filter tailings facility is not a dry stack facility, okay? Now these quotes, uh, this is off of the website of Knight Piasold, a uh, very large uh, mining consulting company uh, based in Denver, has projects all over the world. The present authors would encourage practitioners to abandon the use of the term dry stacking in favor of the more straightforward term filter tailings. It is not desirable to unintentionally mislead the public at large, okay? And by the way, if the tailings were literally dry, they could not be compacted. It would just be like trying to compact a dust or, or a dry sand, okay? So I'm gonna use the phrase filter tailings and avoid dry tailings, uh, which is what Twin Metals has been saying. Okay, more about the state of the art. Um, on the left, a study of tailings management technologies, uh, very widely regarded port for the mining industry. Uh, these facilities are mostly in arid regions. Uh, the maximum production rate at the present time is 20,000 metric tons per day at the Carrara mine in Western Australia, very dry environment. Um, that's equal to the proposed production at the Twin Metals mine. They are mostly less than 30 meters high uh, by contrast, the filter tailings facility at the Twin Metals mine would be 40 meters high. Okay, so what is the issue is why are they in, in arid regions, okay? The issue is that you need the tailings leaving the filter presses with the right water content for optimum compaction. And if you try to do this in a very rainy area, no matter what water content the tailings have when they leave the filter presses, if it rains on them, now they're too wet, okay? So that's the issue with um, doing this technology in a humid area. Okay, now I'm gonna contrast two points of view, uh, one from SRK Consulting and the other from SRK Consulting, okay? Now this happens to be the same consulting company. Um, SRK Consulting are the gentlemen who wrote the um, filter tailings plan uh, for the Twin Metals uh, project. And what SRK Consulting says in that Twin Metals plan and what they say on their very own website are inconsistent. Okay, so let me explain that, okay? First in the left-hand side in the middle, this is right off of the website of SRK Consulting. Commonly projects are specifying or promising a target filter cake moisture at the limit of the filter performance. A 15% moisture content remains a typical target, while tracking of day in and day out moisture contents of filter cakes demonstrates that achievable moisture contents are often in the range of 17 to 18% when things are running smoothly and can be up to 20 to 30% when off spec. 
Okay, now, but what do we read in the Twin Metals Plan, written by the same consulting company on the right-hand side? The Tavings filter cake produced by the filter plant would be a dry, 13 to 60% moisture, silty sandy material. Okay, so what is being promised in the Twin Metals Plan seems to be somewhat beyond um, what is currently um, technologically possible for filter tailings. Okay, so let's look more at the SRK Consulting website, which I'm finding um, a reliable source of information. Okay, we're asked the question, well, what do you do about the fact um, that you don't have very good control um, of the moisture content of the tailings after they leave the filter presses um, on the left? The tailings engineer can, however, specify acceptable moisture contents for different areas of the dry stack. For example, external structural zones may have more stringent criteria than non-structural zones for which reduced constraints may be allowed. Now, this is what is being said here. If we look at the diagram on the right, okay, uh, they are telling us that the tailings that are too wet to be properly compacted put those in the middle, but the tailings that have the right water content for compaction put those on the perimeter and use them to build a structural zone to contain the tailings that are too wet, okay? And that structural zone is in fact a dam, okay, as we are told. If filter tailings are placed in a standalone facility, a pile, a stack, the outer slopes must maintain structural stability, similar to a dam or a waste dump, particularly under seismic loading conditions. Okay, so we're told here that yes, filter tailings actually do need a dam. Okay, but that word dam does not come up anywhere in the Twin Metals plan except to say that there will be no dam. I will repeat this. Tailings stored in dry stacks or piles of sand taught by native soil and vegetation. There is no need for a dam to hold them in place, no possibility of dam failure, and no long-term storage issues. Okay, well, well, what does that mean if you won't use the word dam? What's that do for you? Does that mean you're exempt from all dam safety regulations? Does that mean you're exempt from any consideration of the design criteria for the dam? That is inflow design flood, design earthquake, etc. I'm asking again, what happens if you just won't use that word dam? Does that mean you're exempt from considering the consequences of dam failure? But I can tell you the consequences of dam failure. Um, this is their dry stack facility, which I'm calling a filter tailings facility, which is what most consultants call it, okay? Well, that's right on the edge of Birch Lake. So a failure of this dam, which they won't call a dam, would be the release of 96 million metric tons of tailings um, into Birch Lake. Okay, this is a very nice photo. I, I didn't take this. Um, but this is from Birch Lake looking, just back up here, it's from Birch Lake looking toward uh, where that um, filter tailings facility would be. Uh, you could see it would be quite a, a steep drop um, as all of this, uh, quite a splash as all those tailings uh, came down into Birch Lake. Okay, now I, I want to come to this other question of zero discharge. No water from the mining project will be released into the environment. Okay, so what does that mean? It means there will be a total recycling of water within the mining project. That is all the water that comes into the project will be consumed by the project, so there's no output. Okay, well, let's look at the parts of that equation. Where, how is their input of water? There's groundwater entry into the underground mine. Twin Metals has estimated that at 53,000 gallons per hour. There'll be precipitation and surface runoff onto the project site. That has not been estimated. Um, there'll be withdrawal of water from Birch Lake. Um, in terms of consumption of water, there'll be evaporation. Uh, that has not been estimated. There'll be storage of water in the filter tailings uh, based on numbers in the Twin Metals plan. I estimated that at 27,350 gallons per hour. Uh, there'll be water that is entrained uh, in the 
copper concentrate that will be shipped away, and that has not been estimated. Okay, now the only variable here that's under the control of the mining company is the water that they take out of Birch Lake. Okay, so the idea is that they can take more or less water out of Birch Lake as they need to do so in order to balance this equation. Okay, uh, even though most of these numbers are unknown. Uh, I'll look at this groundwater entry. Okay, here's the data that went into the calculation of the groundwater entry rate. Um, this is the bedrock hydraulic conductivity. We'll see that varies over nine orders of magnitude. Okay, quite a huge scatter in those numbers. Um, by the way, they've only estimated hydraulic conductivity down to 2,300 feet, even though the mine will extend to 4,500 feet below the surface. If I back up here, we can see that really, yeah, really the mining company, if, if, if they're consuming a lot of water, they can just pull more water out of Birch Lake. But the issue is what happens if all of these inputs, groundwater entry, precipitation, surface runoff, what if that exceeds the rate at which they consume water? Okay, they can stop pulling water out of Birch Lake, but what if these numbers are exceeding the amount of water that they can consume? Okay, well, we have ponds uh, to store any excess water um, on the left. The contact water ponds would be sized to contain a 100-year, 24-hour storm event. The collective storage capacity of the contact water ponds for the line dry stack facility during operation would be sized to meet the storm water runoff requirements from a 100-year snowpack. Okay, we'll look on the right. Uh, the process water pond would be sized to contain direct precipitation from the 100-year, 24-hour storm event. Okay, so the concern is, uh, what if we have a 100-year flood? Okay, we have ponds that will contain that excess water. Okay, but this 100-year flood, in any given year, there's a 1% probability that that would occur, meaning that in any given year, there's a 1% probability that these ponds would just overflow and there'll be an uncontrolled release of untreated water um, into the environment. Okay, by the way, this whole idea of zero discharge, of endless recycling of water, this ends when you close the mine. When you close the mine, um, you're not consuming water on the mining project any longer, okay? Um, so they tell us if test work and engineering analyses show water treatment or other water management methods are required, then water treatment systems and management methods would be evaluated and designed as part of future studies. Okay, so uh, whether and how they need water treatment, um, that will all be decided at a later time. Um, by the way, there could be a temporary closure of the mine just due to a fall in copper prices. Um, and that is stated in the Twin Metals Plan. Uh, so with this fall in copper prices, there's going to be suddenly an investment in water treatment technology. Mm, maybe not so realistic. Okay. By the way, um, these filter tailings in the filter tailings facility, um, they're getting rained on, okay? Um, or surface runoff is contacting them. Uh, but there'll be dikes uh, surrounding that facility to channel any runoff away. Okay. So we see the diversion dikes would be designed to hold back the runoff from a 100-year, 24-hour storm event. The overflow weirs and non-contact water ditches would be designed to convey the 100-year, 24-hour storm event. Okay, so again we see the annual probability of re-wetting these filter tailings due to surface runoff that is 1% in any given year. Okay, so everything is designed with a 1% probability of failure in any given year. That is 1% probability of catastrophe in any given year, okay? Now, is that acceptable, okay? That is, does, does our society accept a 1% annual probability of an environmental disaster from a particular project, okay? And by the way, 1% every year, if you say, but well, what's the probability that would occur once over a 20-year period, um, that's 18.2%, okay? So does our society accept 
an 18.2% probability of an environmental disaster occurring over a 20 year period. Okay, well, let's look at some analogies. Um, these are guidelines from Federal Emergency Management Agency. Dams assign the low hazard potential classification are those dams for which failure or misoperation results in no probable loss of human life and low economic and or environmental losses. Losses are principally limited to the dam owner's property, okay? For dams in that classification, low has potential, yes, you can design them to accommodate no more than a 100 year flood. Okay, that is if there's no one loses their life, there's very low environmental losses, the damage is just to your own property. Okay, but clearly um, these criteria would not apply to the Twin Metals project, which could cause extensive environmental losses to um, um, Birch Lake and to the Boundary Waters area. Okay, more from FEMA. Uh, dams assign the significant hazard potential classification are those dams for which failure or misoperation results in no probable loss of human life, but can cause economic loss, environmental damage, disruption of lifeline facilities, or can impact other concerns, okay? Now in that case, the dam should be designed so that it can withstand the 1,000 year flood. That is a, a dam, who, a flood whose annual probability of occurrence or exceedance would be 0.1%. Uh, some more comparisons, uh, very highly regarded dam safety guidelines of the Canadian Dam Association. Uh, this association has five classes of dams and the, the dam class depends upon the consequences of failure. Okay, so let's look into this column, environmental and cultural values. Okay, what is meant by high consequences? Significant loss or deterioration of important fish or wildlife habitat very high consequences, significant loss or deterioration of critical fish or wildlife habitat, um, extreme consequences, major loss of critical fish or wildlife habitat, uh, which would apply to the spilling of 96 million metric tons of mine tailings into Birch Lake, uh, which kind of loss of fish or wildlife habitat? Uh, well, I don't know because uh, Twin Metals has never considered this, because they have never considered the consequences of dam failure, because of course there is no dam. Okay, now I, I wanna bring up another question because we've been talking about two aspects of this mining project. One is the use of filter tailings, and the other is the zero water treatment or, or zero water discharge. Now are these even compatible concepts, okay? Now let me explain more, what does this mean to say no water treatment, no water discharge, okay? It's like you have a sink and you're gonna wash dishes in that sink, um, but there's no drain on the sink, okay? You can never let the water out. You can wash, you can wash, you can wash, you can never let the water out. Um, you can add new water from the faucet, um, but you can't do that endlessly because then the sink will just overflow. Okay, so the water just gets dirtier and dirtier until the water simply cannot hold any, anything else that can be dissolved. Okay, now at that point, does the water even work anymore in terms of washing anything? Okay, and we have a similar situation here. Okay, we have water in this mining project that will be endlessly recycled. Okay, meaning eventually that water will dissolve everything from the ore that can be dissolved or everything from the reagents that can be dissolved until the water cannot hold any more soluble material. We say the water is now saturated with salt, okay? Now what happens when that water and tailings arrive at these filter plates? What keeps those salts from just crystallizing, precipitating in the pores of the filter plates and continuously clogging those filter plates? I don't know the answer to that, okay? Now, what we see on the left is um, washing of the filter plates to unclog the pores. And in the case of this mining project with its endless recycling of water 
into the water just cannot hold any more salt, well, what are you even going to wash the filter plates with? That same water that's already completely saturated in salt? Well, then even the water you're washing the pores with will um, precipitate salts in those pores. And then another question is, this water that you're using to process the ore, how did it even work anymore in terms of ore processing, in terms of pulling the copper out, um, if the water is completely saturated with salts, completely saturated with soluble material, okay? And in fact, um, all of these questions came up at a meeting I attended. Uh, this was Society for, of Mining, Metallurgy, and Exploration. This was in Phoenix. Uh, this particular session was uh, February 26th uh, of this year. Um, it was a session on um, the latest ideas in filter tailings. Um, and a member of the panel was Glenn Barr, who's the Vice President for Engineering at Twin Metals. Um, and this was a, uh, would have been a great opportunity for um, um, Mr. Barr um, to explain how Twin Metals has figured all this out. Um, but he did not take that opportunity. Okay, uh, just to summarize, uh, the plan for a filter tailings facility exceeds current technology according to information available on the consultant's own website. The plan to construct a tailings facility with no dam is both nonsensical and deceitful. The plan for zero discharge with no backup water treatment implies a 1% annual probability of uncontrolled discharge of untreated mine water into Birch Lake. And finally, filter tailings and zero discharge are incompatible technologies. And uh, thank you very much uh, for listening. Um, that's my email. Um, if anyone has any questions, or I, I'm taking questions now also. And uh, uh, just letting you know about the next webinar on May 6th, a route planning in Keitako Provincial Park, discovering Canada's boundary waters. Um, and with that, I'll take any questions. Great, uh, uh, Dr. Armand, thank you so much for uh, for that presentation here. We, uh, you know, I want to uh, get get to the use of uh, terminology again here and and emphasize why uh, why the, the term dry stacking is such a misleading term. Why don't you talk about that for a little bit some more? Oh, okay, okay, okay. So what, 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 what's actually done? Okay, so technically it's called filter tailings, okay? Um, so what comes from the ore processing plant is um, solid particles, crushed rock particles with lots and lots of water, okay? So in the filter tailings, um, that mass of water and tailings is uh, squeezed uh, through filter presses and most of the water is removed um, at the end, uh, you have a mass of tailings with about 25% water. Um, it would feel and behave much less like a moist soil, okay? Uh, part of the advantage is that you can then compact it, okay? Just like you had a fistful of moist soil, you could squeeze it down very nicely and compact it all, uh, okay? Um, it's really misleading to call these dry tailings because they're not literally dry, they're moist, okay? Um, I didn't know, dry, dry seems to give the impression, um, it seems to give the impression they cannot fail under any circumstances. Um, having said that, I'm not quite sure why, okay? Um, the key thing about tailings that are literally dry is if that was the case, you couldn't compact them. It would just be like a dust, it would just be like dry sand. Um, you couldn't compact at all. It wouldn't have any strength, okay? You get the greatest strength when you have the proper optimum water content, which is about 20, 25% water. Um, okay? Great. We have a, a couple technical questions okay. as well, Dr. Emerson. One, one is uh, uh, curious about the potential for ARD since copper nickel ore bodies are usually BMS type deposits. What are their kinetic test show in terms of reactivity? Okay. Um, Perhaps you can translate that, that question. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. I, I can do so. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll just kind of, first of all, sort of expand on the question for, uh, for everybody. Um, 
So in, in any kind of sulfide mining, uh, something called um, acid rock drainage or acid mine drainage is, is a possibility, okay? Um, so what happens is that you have sulfide minerals uh, below the surface. When those sulfide minerals are exposed on the surface, they will then combine with water and oxygen, okay? That's a reaction that can't occur when the sulfides are buried. But when they're on the surface, for example, as mine tailings, they can combine with water and oxygen. And in doing so, the sulfide minerals then turn into sulfuric acid, okay? Now, you have problems if that sulfuric acid is then released into the environment, okay? That can affect aquatic organisms, that can affect water supply. Um, anyway, I guess that's a summary. Okay, so that's the issue of acid mine drainage, okay? Um, now, the other question, which was related to kinetic testing, is that um, people try to reach a decision as to a particular type of mine tailings. Um, um, is acid mine drainage, is or is it not a possibility? Okay? So, um, usually people start with a, what's called a static test or a screening test. Just says, in these mine tailings, um, how much, what is the sulfide content? Uh, what other minerals are available that could neutralize the sulfuric acid. That's a preliminary screening. Uh, then people do what's called a short-term leach test. That is take this, these tailings, uh, mix it with water, or stir it, um, mix it for some amount of time, and, you know, short, like 18 hours, um, and then see what's, what's come into the water, okay? But to actually make predictions about acid mine drainage, you have to do what's called kinetic tests. Okay, that is let these tailings and water and oxygen react um, minimum 20 weeks, sometimes as much as two to three years, um, and see what is coming out of the water. Okay, um, I have not seen kinetic tests done on these tailings. Okay, um, it could be something done that has not, I have not seen, okay, but I don't know the kinetic tests have been done yet. Okay, um, so anyway, um, that's, that's my answer. Mostly I just expanded on your question. Okay, and so uh, in short, one of the uh, primary risks from this, the, uh, this type of mining is the creation of sulfuric acid uh, when the reactive ore comes in content with, uh, with air and water. Um, um, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just answer you, okay. Okay, in, in, in terms of the important risks, okay, um, the number one risk is the possibility of catastrophic failure of the tailings facility, okay? Um, that is the release of all of these, the dump of all of these tailings into Birch Lake, okay? Uh, that's always the number one risk, okay? The number two risk are processes will occur more slowly. Uh, that would be the release of, of, um, of acidic mine water um, into groundwater and then, and then, of course, potentially into the boundary waters. Great. We have a, a, another uh, technical question here. Okay. Uh, is it, isn't the moisture content of filtered tailings determined by the particle size of the tailings? Isn't it true that the course of the tailings the lower the moisture? So don't the part so uh, doesn't the particle size of the tailings need to be considered to determine the moisture? Why didn't you discuss particle size when considering tailing moisture content? Oh, oh, okay, okay, excellent point. Okay, so. Um, Okay, so let's see. Um, if, if we start off with it, the, uh, what's coming from the ore processing plant, okay? Um, it can be a, a mass of, of water, tailings and a lot of water, it's called a slurry, okay? Um, it could be thickened into a paste. It could be thickened into more, what we call a high density paste, okay? Finally, it could be thickened uh, into what we call filter tailings. Um, the divisions between those different types of tailings aren't a particular moisture content, okay? The differences are the, the behavior of the tailings, uh, technical terms we call rheology, okay? That is how those tailings do or, not, do, or do not deform under certain stresses, okay? Um, at the moisture content where the tailings behave like a moist soil, they're called filter tailings. Okay, what that moisture content has to be 
depends upon the nature of the tailings, okay, including their particle size, including many other characteristics, uh, okay? Um, so I would say, just based upon what I've read thus far about this project, um, at this point, the exact water content that will be needed to achieve the behavior of a moist soil um, is not yet known, okay? Uh, but the question is correct, okay? It's not, it's not the water content that determines the state of filter tailings, but how the tailings behave. Great. We have uh, a couple questions relating to uh, uh, the, the risk of failure, and uh, the uh, and maybe you want to uh, discuss the, the 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 probability that the uh, one in a hundred year dam failure versus a a one in a, a, a thousand or ten thousand uh, failure probability. Perhaps would you discuss that probability and and how that probability compounds over over the over a twenty year life of the mine or or, or longer throughout uh, uh, past the when the mine is closed a bit. Uh, um, but the, uh, the filter tailing stack is still there. Oh, okay, okay, it's a great question. Okay, so um, there, there's many um, regulations and guidelines for dam safety throughout the world, okay? Although they tend to have a lot in common, um, they tend to have a th kind of a, a three-way classification of dams is, is very common, okay? So uh, what's done by FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency, um, I'll kind of use that. I mean, that's very, that's very standard for, for federal, federally funded projects in the U.S., okay? So uh, low hazard potential means that in any given year, um, it's okay to have a 1% probability of failure, okay? Low hazard potential really just means no economic loss, no environmental loss. It just dumps the water or the waste on the owner's own property, Okay. Um, that's how low the consequences have to be to be able to say this dam will only survive a 100-year flood, okay? Now, when you start looking at dams whose failure could cause environmental damage, uh, damage to lifeline facilities, that is uh, power plants, water treatment plants, um, economic losses, um, that's called significant hazard potential. Um, and those dams should be designed to withstand thousand year floods, okay? Thousand year flood in any given year that has a probability of occurrence of 0.1%, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, then you get into what's called high hazard potential. High hazard potential means that if this dam fails, uh, someone will probably lose their life, just one person, okay? If one person is expected to lose a life if the dam fails, um, then the dam should be designed to withstand what's called the probable maximum flood, okay? That is the greatest flood that um, is even theoretically possible at a given location, okay? And that could be something like the 100,000 year flood, the million year flood, okay? The flood whose probability of occurrence in any given year is one in a million. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, when we talk about the twin mine site, where they state right out outright that an environmental catastrophe has a one percent probability of occurrence in any given year, that's not really in accordance with our societal standards. Okay, mm -hmm. um, it really should be something more on the lines of zero point one percent per year. Okay. Um, this answer your question? I think so. Thanks, so. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Dr. Emmerman. There's a, uh, another question here that um, I do not understand how there can be dumping of tailings into the lake when there is a moisture content that is equivalent to moist soil. The dam information does not seem uh, to apply to the situation. And, and maybe maybe I'll, I'll, I'll tee this up by by saying the, uh, this way that that when the diagram that you showed during your presentation, what you show is that the, the way they designed that that uh, filter tailing stack is that you have uh, on the on the periphery you have uh, that that soil has to hold back water within it. So and in fact, it, it, what you call a structure that holds back moisture water is a, is a dam. So maybe you want to talk about that a little bit more. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I got lost my screen right there. Okay, I, I guess I'll go to that diagram. Okay, because this, this is a very good question. Okay, uh, can you see that okay? 
or I'll just say from the current slide. Yeah. Okay, does that look good? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, that's what I meant to do. Okay. Okay, so, so this is a good question. Okay, we're asking, what, you know, how could it happen that this dam would fail, okay? So what's being labeled here as a structural zone, uh, in fact, that, that serves the same role as a dam, okay? Uh, the term structural zone is used with filter tailings, but um, many publications will, will clarify it. Uh, it simply is, is another word for a dam, okay? Um, so it's important to consider um, what are the various mechanisms by which failure could occur, okay? And this especially a failure that could end up as a flow, okay? This could flow that could, that could finally make its way to Birch Lake, okay? And um, so, so let me mention a couple of possibilities, okay? So these are all things that would need to be considered. Um, one is the possibility of re-wetting of these tailings, okay? So the tailings that were not saturated when they were placed in the facility, then later became saturated. Okay, so how, how could that happen? Okay, um, first of all, we have rainfall onto these tailings. Okay, but most important, we have rainfall onto the entire project site. Okay, now we do have dikes around the filter tailings that are intended to co convey any stormwater around the tailings. Okay, so the stormwater doesn't interact with the tailings. Okay, but we're also told in the Twin Metals plan that those diversion dikes, sometimes they're called perimeter channels, okay, that those diversion dikes uh, will overflow in a 100 year flood. Okay, that is there's a 1% probability in any given year, those diversion dikes will overflow and they'll dump their excess water onto these filter tailings. Okay, um, so that is important to consider. Um, another um, aspect, um, um, that sometimes, sometimes has come about, okay, is simply um, um, the slow settling of the filter tailings can again saturate the pores, okay? That is, the pores might be unsaturated with the tailings sitting here, but as the mass slowly compacts, those pores can get resaturated, okay? So this is one of the essential issues in a filter tailings plant um, is how to avoid that that resaturation of the filter tailings, okay? Um, if I could just mention one other thing, um, you know, one of the nice things about having uh, filter tailings instead of, you know, very wet tailings is that even if there's a failure of this dam, the structural zone, the filter tailings will just slump, okay? There won't be a flood traveling 75 miles per hour as happened at Brumaginio, okay? Problems can come about when after the filter tailings slump, they slump into a body of water, okay? And um, I've seen some projects I've been critical of um, when um, the body of water is immediately um, down slope from the filter tailings facility, okay? And if that happens, there was no point in filtering the tailings uh, because the whole mass then undergoes a, a flow failure, okay? Uh, just to mention one of the things from this diagram, um, there also are issues with water running off the structural zone um, and in a major flood, can this runoff off the structural zone uh, basically erode the structural zone away, okay? Uh, so the other questioner has some good points, okay? So um, um, these are all issues that need to be considered in terms of, of the safety of a filter tailings facility. You know, uh, maybe a, a final related question uh, to the uh, the uh, one in a hundred year uh, uh, event is that with with climate change is that is that changing the uh, the frequency of these uh, these uh, 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 precipitation events? Okay, <clears throat> okay, th th this is an excellent question. Okay, um, everybody who's in the business of thinking about hundred year flood, thousand year flood, okay is worried about climate change, okay? Um, um, I do, I'm doing a lot of consulting in the Gulf Coast area now, okay? Um, so that's a big consideration in terms of hurricanes and do we even know what a thousand year flood is anymore, uh, okay? Um, it, it, it becomes most important when you have dams whose failure could cause loss of human life in which case they need to be designed for the probable maximum flood, okay? 
And in the face of climate change, which has its own uncertainties, do we even know what the probable maximum flood is? Uh, okay. Um, so, so yes, these are considerations, okay? Um, I would say um, in terms of even choosing, if someone was going to design this facility to accommodate a 100-year flood, which I would not recommend, it should be designed to accommodate a 1,000-year flood. Um, you'd have to consider this 100-year flood or 1,000-year flood, what's the uncertainty in that? Uh, how well are these even known? Okay, I would be very conservative about choosing uh, the appropriate value for 100-year flood or 1,000-year flood that was appropriate uh, for this facility, okay? So yes, climate change simply adds another layer of uncertainty. Um, it's another need to be very conservative in design. Great, uh, Dr. Armand. If you would uh, go back to the last slide of the presentation. Uh, sure. Oop, oop. There we go. This one? There we go. Yep. Yep. Uh, I know there are, are just still some more questions out there. Um, I, I do want to respect everyone's time here. Uh, feel free to reach out directly to the staff at the Friends and we can uh, 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 answer your questions off offline here. I want to uh, uh, thank uh, uh, Dr. Emmerman for this, uh, this great presentation and, and thank you to Scott Bochamp, our policy director, for helping answer the, the questions during this presentation. Uh, the, this presentation will be available. We'll make it available on our website and we'll also email a link to you of the recording so that you can uh, see it again and, and share it with others. Please, please pass it along and, and, and share. Uh, our next webinar will be uh, on Wednesday, May 6th on, on route planning in Quetico Provincial Park, the, discovering Canada's boundary waters. And Kim Young, whose nickname is uh, Quetico Kim, she's a, a, a board member of Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness and a, a frequent, frequent contributor to the Boundary Waters Journal and a, a wealth of knowledge about the, the Quetico, will be giving that presentation on route planning. So you will, uh, won't want to miss that, that present presentation. Uh, I want to also mention that beginning this Friday, May 1st, and lasting a week, there's a special giving week for Minnesota nonprofits. It's called Give at Home MN, and uh, Friends of the Boundary Waters is Wilderness. Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness is participating in that. And you can, uh, 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 if you like what you saw today and want to support more of our work in this area, please go to givemn.org/backslash/bwca, and you can. Uh, can uh, contribute to that. We have a, a $20,000 match, and we hope that you will uh, uh, make a donation to contribute to that match. So from, um, again, thank you to Dr. Emmerman, and uh, thank you to all of you for, for joining us this afternoon. We look forward to having you at, at, at future uh, presentations that we have every Wednesday at 12 noon Central Time. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. And Steve, if you want to please stop the recording there. Um.